Hello, welcome to my channel. Today I am going to go through the BMAT 2017 Section 2. This exam has 27 questions and has a duration of 30 minutes. Just a quick reminder, please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want more content like this. Also, leave a comment if you want further clarification on any explanations. Now, without further ado, let's start answering the questions. Question number one. The diagram shows a section through part of a healthy human. Which row in the table shows the correct secretions from P, Q, and R? So let's look at the diagram and look at the table. The aim of this question is to correctly identify what secretions come from what organ. So this is a test of knowledge. Can't really use much problem solving skills here, but you can do a bit. So let's start answering the question. So organ P, what is organ P? Organ P is a gallbladder and it stores and releases bile. That's the only function it has. So immediately we know the answer is A, but I'll still go through Q and R. Just to make it clear that the answer is A. Organ Q. Organ Q is the stomach. And as you know, it releases protease and stomach acid. And does that match with what we've got uh, as our option for A for Q? Yes, it does, because it says secretions from Q, protease and hy hydrogen concentration hydrochloric acid, which is in the stomach, is an acid and therefore has lots of hydrogen ions. So Q is right. And R, R is the pancreas, and the pancreas secretes insulin in addition to some other enzymes like proteases, lipases, and amylases. So for sure, the answer is A, and that's question number one completed. Question number two. This diagram shows an electrolysis experiment. The diagram is below. Which reaction occurs at the anode and which reaction occurs at the cathode for this experiment? So this question is assessing you on your knowledge of electrochemistry. And immediately you should be thinking about oil rig. And what does oil rig stand for? The oil part of oil rig stands for Oxidation is loss of electrons, and the rig part of oil rig stands for reduction is gain of electrons. Now, armed with this knowledge, let's now try and work out the answer to this question. So, where is oxidation occurring, and where is reduction occurring? So, you know they're occurring at each electrode, Reduction always occurs at the cathode. And oxidation always occurs at the anode. And this is a rule, but the best way that I like to remember this rule is by thinking that the cathode always has a negative symbol on top of it. It's negative. And what is reduction is the gaining of electrons Electrons are negative, so you know what the cathode is from the diagram, and therefore you know the anode is the positive side. Now, we need to work out what half equation is occurring at each electrode. So, I like to start off with the cathode. At the cathode, you know that electrons are being gained. And let's talk a bit more about the system first you know that there's a copper 2 sulfate solution as your electrolyte, and the two electrodes are made out of solid copper. So, you know that solid copper will be formed at the cathode. So immediately, you could eliminate anything that doesn't have solid copper at forming at the cathode. So let's eliminate B, C, D, 
And let's look at these two half equations that are remaining on the cathode side. Yep, they're both correct. The copper 2 ion that's in the solution gains two electrons to form copper 2 so uh, solid. And that is correct in regards to our statement of reduction is gain of electrons. Now, let's focus on the anode. As I mentioned before, both electrodes are made out of copper. And in this system, we need to replenish the copper ions that is in the copper 2 sulfate solution. And we also need to replenish the electrons that are being used by the cathode. So, how do we do this? We get solid copper and we oxidize it to get copper 2 plus ions that goes into the copper 2 sulfate solution and two electrons that go directly to the cathode and reduces copper 2 plus ions into solid copper. So therefore, A is eliminated, and the answer is E. And that's question number two completed. Question number three. Below are four statements about electromagnetic waves. Number one, microwaves have smaller wavelength than visible light. Two, the speed of visible light in a vacuum is higher than the speed of other types of electromagnetic wave. Number three, gamma rays have the largest wavelength of any electromagnetic wave. Four, radio waves are used in hospital radiography to look for broken bones. Which statements are correct? Now, you can do this by deduction, but ideally speaking, you just want to go through each statement and identify if it's true or false, and that's what I'm going to do, and then you'll be able to get your answer. So statement number one, microwaves have a smaller wavelength than visible light. This is incorrect. Microwaves have a longer wavelength than visible light, so let's knock out number one. Statement number two, the visible the speed of visible light in a vacuum is higher than the speed of other types of electromagnetic wave. This is false because the speed of all light is the same in a vacuum. Let's knock that out. Statement number three, gamma rays have the largest wavelength of any electromagnetic wave. This is false. It has the smallest wavelength of any electromagnetic wave. Let's knock that out. Four, radio waves are used in hospital radiography to look for broken bones. This is very, very obvious. Most of you are aspiring medics. They use x-rays in hospital radiography to look for broken bones. That's why people go, oh, I'm going to get an x-ray of my arm. So four is incorrect. And guess what? None of them are right, and the answer is A. And that is statement, that's question number three completed. Question number four. Which one of the following is equivalent to, open bracket, root five, minus two, close bracket, squared? So this question is a calculate question. You cannot use any deduction at all to work out your answer. And this question is combining your knowledge of quadratic equations as well as thirds. So let's get right into the question. The first step that I would do is expand the brackets. So that'll be root 5 minus 2, close bracket, open bracket, root 5 minus 2. Now I will actually remove the brackets and expand. So root 5 times root 5 is 5, root 5 times by minus 2 is minus 2 root 5, minus 2 times root 5 is minus 2 root 5, and minus 2 times minus 2 is positive 4, so plus 4. And let's simplify that down, and that goes to 9 minus 4 root 5, and therefore the answer is F. And that is question number four completed. Question number five. SCID is an inherited condition in humans. 
people with some types of SEID are unable to make a functional enzyme necessary for the production of healthy white blood cells. A scientist studying these types of SEID compared the features of the DNA and the structure of the enzyme in people who have this condition and people without SEID. Which of the following features may, be, may have been different? So, statement number one, the allele of the gene coding for the enzyme. Statement number two, the order of the amino acids in the enzyme. Statement number three, the order of the bases in the gene coding for the enzyme. Statement number four, the shape of the active site of the enzyme. Now, this question, you can use elimination. And this question is assessing your knowledge of proteins, amino acids, DNA, transcription, and translation, and how that all fits together. So... The immediate thing that should be standing out to you from this question is that the correct enzyme isn't being formed. It's non-functional. And enzymes are proteins, and proteins are coded by mRNA, and that mRNA is copied from the DNA. So there must be a problem in all of those stages within the DNA, within transcription, within translation, and uh, post-primary uh, uh, protein formation, as in like forming the primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and maybe the quaternary structure, if there is that structure in this enzyme protein. So armed with that knowledge, let's answer the question. So... Statement number one, the allele of the gene coding for the enzyme. That will be different because there's going to be different bases. That's why different amino acids were formed. That's why different protein was formed. So that is correct. Number two, the order of the amino acids in the enzyme. That could be another possibility. Yep. The order of the bases in the gene coding for the enzyme. Also true. Four, the shape of the active site of the enzyme. Completely true. The active site of the enzyme will change because there's a different amino acid structure, a different pro 3D protein structure shape. So we know that all four statements are correct. And therefore, the answer is G. Question number six. Which of the following atoms and ions contain 20 neutrons and 18 electrons? This question is basically maths disguised as chemistry. And what you need to know is how to work out number of electrons and number of neutrons. How do you work out the number of electrons? You look at the atomic number for the number of electrons. If it's an atom, whatever the atomic number is, that's the number of electrons. If it's an ion, you either add or subtract however many charges that have been put on, depending if it's positive or negative. In regards to working out the number of neutrons, that is the atomic mass minus the atomic number that gives you the number of neutrons. So armed with this information, let's answer the question. So statement number one, the number of neutrons is going to be 34 minus 16, which is equal to 18. And the number of electrons is going to be 16 plus 2, which is equal to 18. The reason for this is because the sulfur ion has a 2 minus charge. Therefore, it's gain to electrons. So we have to add 2 onto the atomic number. That gives us 18. And with this knowledge, we know that number 1 is incorrect. It doesn't meet our requirement of 20 neutrons and 18 electrons. Now moving on to number 2, the number of Neutrons is going to be 37 minus 17, which is equal to 20. 
and the number of electrons is going to be 17 plus 1. The reason why it's going to be 17 plus 1 is because the chloride ion has a 1 minus charge and therefore the chlorine atom gained an electron to turn into the ion. And does that meet our requirement of 20 neutrons and 18 electrons? Yes, it does. So let's put a tick there. Let's start eliminating. So we eliminate A, we eliminate C, we eliminate F. And also we could start eliminating stuff with one in there as well. Why not? So eliminate B, let's eliminate H. Now, atom slash ion number three. It's an atom. So let's work out the number of neutrons. Number of neutrons is going to be 40 minus 18, which is equal to 22. And the number of electrons is 18 because that's its atomic number and it's an atom, not an ion. Straight away, we know it cannot be number three. Let's cross that out and therefore we could eliminate Oh, we can't eliminate anything because we've already done prior eliminations. Now, let's move on to atom slash ion number four. Number four is an ion. And to work out the number of neutrons, it's going to be 39 minus 19, which is equal to 20 neutrons. And to work out the number of electrons, we need to use 19 minus... 1, which is equal to 18. The reason why I minus 1 is because it's a positive charge. A electron has been removed from the atom, making it a positive charge. Are there 20 neutrons and 18 electrons in this ion? Yes, there is. So anything with number 4 is correct. So we could eliminate E. Now, number 5. The number of neutrons in number 5 is 40 minus 20, which is equal to 20. And the number of electrons is 18. Is not 18, it's 20. The reason why it's 20 is because it's an atom, not an ion. This, uh, and the number of electrons denoted by the atomic number is 20. Therefore, number 5 does not meet a requirement of 20 neutrons and 18 electrons. We can eliminate G, and our answer is D. That's question number six completed. Question number seven. A puddle is left on the road after a rain shower. The puddle, the water in the puddle slowly disappears by evaporation. The three statements about the effect of changing different conditions on this process are given below. Statement number one. The rate of evaporation is greater at higher temperature. Statement number two, the rate of evaporation is greater when the air above the puddle is still. Statement number three, the rate of evaporation is greater when the puddle has a larger surface area. Which of the statements is slash r correct? So this question is using your knowledge of physics and what variables affect evaporation in particular. So let's look at statement number one. The rate of evaporation is greater at high temperatures. This is true because the water, the water molecules in that puddle will have greater kinetic energy. Therefore, they're more likely to evaporate. So number one is correct. And let's start doing some eliminating. So it can't be A, the answer, can't be C, can't be D, and it can't be G. Moving on, statement number two. The rate of evaporation is greater when the air above the puddle is still. This is incorrect because if there's a convection current, if the air is moving and circulating, evaporation would occur a lot quicker. So... Number two is incorrect, and we could do some eliminating. Eliminating is great for these exams. Sometimes you don't have to work out the answer of the question. You can simply just work out part of the question or do some deductions, and you've got 
your answer in the form of a multiple choice letter. So anything with two. Now, statement number three. The rate of evaporation is greater when the puddle has a large surface area. This is correct. This is because there is a larger surface area for the water to gain the kinetic energy, the heat, to cause evaporation. If there's a larger surface area for the same volume of water, therefore more kinetic energy is entering the water and therefore evaporation is going to occur quickly. So therefore number three is correct and we can eliminate B. And the answer to this question is F and that is question number seven completed. Question number eight. In a group of 20 patients at a medical center, five suffered from migraines. Two patients from the group of 20 were picked at random for a survey on the use of painkillers. What is the probability that both of the patients picked suffered from migraines? So immediately you know that five out of the 20 patients suffer from migraines. So at the first round of picking, the probability of them picking a person that does suffer from migraine is 5 over 20. And for the second pick, there are four patients left. If they pick uh, at the first round someone that suffers from migraine. So, you know, the numerator of the second fraction is going to be 4. And the, the denominator is going to be 19. Because there are a total of 19 people left at the end of the first picking. So... That is your multiplication that you're going to be using to work out the answer. So 5 times 4 is equal to 20. That's your numerator. And the denominator is 20 times by 19. And the reason why I did this is to make simplification easier. So make that 1, make that 1. And guess what? The answer is 1 over 19. And therefore, the answer is A. That is question number eight completed. Question number nine. The diagram shows four experiments used to investigate movement of substances across dialysis tubing. This tubing is a partially permeable membrane which allows both glucose and water to pass through it. And there are the experiments. And I'll talk through them really quickly. Experiment one, inside and outside the tubing, it's made up of distilled water. Experiment number two, inside and outside the tubing, it's made up of 10% glucose solution. Experiment number three, only the inside of the tubing is 10% glucose solution. Outside is distilled water. Experiment number four, the outside of the tubing is 10% glucose solution. Inside the tubing is distilled water. So, which row in the table shows the experiments where there will be movement of glucose through the partially permeable membrane and the experiment where there will be movement of water through the partially permeable membrane. Now, this question is really easy if you read it properly. It doesn't refer to the net movement of these molecules, but rather refers to the movement of these molecules. So, armed with this knowledge, let's answer the question. So, I'm going to start off with the movement of water. And the reason why I'm going to do this is because it's the easiest one. In all of the experiments, water will be moving back and forth across the membrane. However, in experiments one and two, there is no net movement of water because the concentration inside and outside of the membrane is the same. So immediately, we can eliminate A, B, C, and D. And guess what? That leaves us with our answer, E. But I'll continue going through the question. Now let's look onto glucose. All of the experiments, bar experiment one, has glucose. Therefore, every experiment except glucose, except experiment one, will have movement of glucose. Fair enough, in experiment number two, there is no net movement of glucose, but there's still movement. Therefore, state, uh, experiments number two, three, and four 
fit this criteria of movement of glucose? Therefore, the answer is E. And that's question number nine completed. Question number 10. A piece of magnesium ribbon is dropped into a beaker of dilute aqueous hydrochloric acid at room temperature. After a while, the production of bubbles of gas slow down. Which of the following statements can correctly explain this observation? Statement number one, particles have less energy. Statement number two, the concentration of hydrochloric acid decreases. Statement number three, the activation energy for the reaction increases. So, this question is looking at your understanding of acid-base chemistry. And you can use elimination for this question, and I highly recommend that you do. Immediately, statement number three should be throwing out red flags because there's no catalyst being referred to this experiment, so the activation energy cannot increase, decrease, it'll stay the same. So therefore, anything with number three is incorrect, so let's do some quick eliminations. D is incorrect, F is incorrect, and H is incorrect. Now... Let's look at statement number two. The concentration of hydrochloric acid decreases. This is true because over time, as the magnesium solid reacts with hydrochloric acid, the hydrochloric acid will be used up to form magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. So statement number two is correct. So anything with statement number two should be deemed Correct. Statement number one. The particles have less energy. That statement should be a red flag. That statement is incorrect. The particles will not change their energy. So that is incorrect. So therefore, the answer to this question is C. And that is question number 10 completed. Question number 11. Two resistors... R1 and R2 are connected in series with a cell. Resistor R1 has twice the resistance of resistor R2. Six statements about this circuit are given below. The voltage across each resistor is the same. The voltage across R1 is twice that across R2. The voltage across R2 is twice that of twice that across R1 the current is the same in both resistors the current in R1 is twice the current current in R2 the current in R2 is twice the current in R1 which pairs of statements is correct so there's your options and now you should be thinking about how you're going to approach this question. So looking at this diagram, what stands out to you? It's a, uh, it's a pretty basic circuit and it, the resistors are added in series. Therefore, the current will be the same at all points of the circuit. So immediately, statement number four is correct. Now, you're going to use Ohm's law, V equals IR, where V is voltage, I is current, R is resistance. Since the current is the same across both resistors, and R1 has twice the resistance of R2, R2 will have half the voltage drop as R1, and therefore C is the correct answer and let's look at why c is correct because it's statements two and four and what did i say the voltage across r1 will be twice that uh, that across r2 i said that r2 will have half the voltage drop as r1 reverse that around the voltage across r1 will be twice that across r2 answers c and that is Question number 11 completed. Question number 12. 
in triangle PRS, line QT is parallel to side RS. RS is equal to 1.5 centimeters, TS is equal to 1.8 centimeters, and QT is equal to 0.3 centimeters. And here's the diagram that they provided for you. What is the length of PS? Now, that's what they want you to work out. And this is a maths question, and it's looking at your, it's trying to assess your knowledge of similar triangles. Triangle P Q T is similar to the big triangle P R S. So therefore, the angles of R P S is the same. P S R are the same, and P and P R S are the same. Knowing that these triangle this triangle is similar the angles are the same we could assume that there is a ratio that could be calculated between the small triangle and the big triangle and we could also deduct that because p uh, qt and rs are parallel the ratio of qt to rs is going to be the same ratio as PT to PS. So let's write that algebraically and then we could start solving. So RS over QT is equal to PS over PT. Okay. So Let's now sub our values in that we have at the top of the question. So, 1.5 over 0 0.3 is equal to PS. And what is PS made of? PT and TS. So let's write PT plus 1.8 over PT. So now, immediately, you should be thinking, okay, on the left-hand side, we could simplify that completely. And the left-hand side is equal to 5. 5 is equal to PT plus 1.8 over PT. Now what we're going to do, we're going to multiply both sides by PT so we could get rid of this denominator PT. So 5PT is equal to PT plus 1.8. And let me just write that in some extra room, 5PT is equal to PT plus 0 0.8. And what do you know? We could get all the PTs on one side, on the left-hand side, and keep a numerical value on the right-hand side. So let's do that, minus both sides by PT. So 4PT is equal to 1.8. And to calculate PT, we need to divide 1.8 by 4. That is equal to 0 0.45. And the answer is going to be C. And that is question number 12 completed. Question number 13. Dolly the sheep was born in 1996. She was unusual because she had no biological father. Sheep have diploid number of 54 chromosomes in their body cells. The diagram shows the process of how sheep was produced. And here's the diagram. You have step one, mammary uh, gland cell donor. Step number two, egg cell donor. 
Number three, cells are fused. Step number four, grown in culture. Step number five, uh, implanted in uterus of the third sheep. Step number six, development, the lamb. Which of the following statements about this process is slash are correct? The gamete nucleus, the cell nucleus contains 27 chromosomes. Two, the cells produced in step four have the same properties as stem cells. Three, number of none of the uh, of the cells involved in the process were produced by meiosis. So, let's look at statement number one. The gamete nucleus, cell nucleus, contains 27 chromosomes. A gamete contains half the number of the usual number of chromosomes in a cell. And in a normal diploid cell, there are 54 chromosomes. So therefore, in a gamete, there will be 27 chromosomes in the cell because it's haploid. So therefore, statement number one is correct. Now, statement number two, the cells produced in step four have the same properties as stem cells. This is true. Embryonic stem cells can differentiate into any type of cell in the body, and that's what stem cells can do, theoretically. So therefore, statement number two is correct. Statement number three. None of the cells involved in the process were produced by meiosis. So let's have another look at the diagram. And what do you know? Step number two, egg cell gamete donor, literally a massive red flag, flag staring you in the face like this is incorrect. An egg cell is a gamete and therefore was produced by meiosis. Therefore, Statement number three is incorrect. Thus, the correct answer to this question is E. That is question number 13. Completed. Question number 14. Disproportionation is the simultaneous oxidation and reduction of the same species in a reaction. Which of the following chemical equations does disproportionation occur? There are five reactions. Now... During a disproportionation reaction, a compound converts, uh, converts to two different compounds, one which has a higher oxidation number and one that has a lower oxidation number of the original compound. So let's say originally a compound, a species in a compound has a oxidation state of zero, the product could have a oxidation state of plus one, and it could have an oxidation state of minus one. And you know that's oxidation, and that's disproportionation, because both oxidation and reduction is occurring. So armed with this knowledge, Let's answer the questions. And for time's sake and convenience sake, I'm only going to go through the ones where disproportionation occurs because it should be relatively straightforward. This is pretty basic A-level slash GCSE chemistry. So in reaction two, copper goes from an oxidation state of plus one to oxidation states of zero and plus two. In reaction three, chlorine goes from oxidation zero to oxidation states of minus one and one. And in reaction five, mercury goes from an oxidation state of plus one to an oxidation state of zero and minus two. And therefore, you know the answer to this question is E. And that is question number 14 completed. Question number 15. Uranium-238 is a naturally occurring alpha emitter. It can be used in the manufacture of the isotope plutonium-239, during which it's bombarded by neutrons. The process of converting a nucleus of uranium 
two three eight to a nucleus of plutonium two three nine is a three stage sequence of nuclear reactions. What is this sequence? So you should technically know these steps from your knowledge of GCSE physics, but I'll go through these steps anyways. You can work this out if you really want to, but you can muddle up where certain things occur, like where a beta particle is emitted or where a neutron is absorbed. So realistically speaking, you should know how this occurs and you should really learn this if you don't know how uranium-238 is converted to plutonium-239. So, step number one, a neutron is added to the uranium-238 to make uranium-239. Then this uranium-239 emits a beta particle and this creates Neptunium-239. And then that in turn decays through uh, beta decay. It releases one beta particle to produce Plutonium-239. And those are the three steps. So, step number one, absorption of a neutron. So immediately we could get rid of A, B, C, and D. And stage number two, emission of an alpha particle. There was no mention of alpha particles. Stage number three, emission of a beta particle. Therefore, the answer to this question is F. That's question number 15 completed. Question number 16. The acceleration due to gravity at the surface of a planet is given by G equals capital G M over R squared, where M and R are the mass and radius of the planet re uh, respectively, and G is a gravitational constant. Given that little g is 10 uh, newtons per kilogram, G is 7 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons meters squared per kg squared, and R is 6 times 10 to the 6 meters, what is M correct to one significant figure? So, this is a maths question, and if you know what to do, it's a straightforward maths question. Step number one will be to rearrange the equation so that M is the subject, and then step number two is substitute and solve. So let's complete step number one. So we're given g is equal to big G m over r squared. We want to make big G the subject. So g is equal to little g r squared over m. So that is the equation that we're going to be using to calculate big G, or I should say the formula. So let's solve. So... Ten times six times ten to the power of six, that's all squared over seven times ten to minus eleven is equal to G. Okay. So what am I going to do? I'm first going to try and simplify the denominator and numerator as much as possible. So let's start with the numerator. That is, I'm going to keep everything in standard form for as long as possible. So 10 times 3.6 times 10 to the 13. And why did I do 3.6 times 10 to the minus 13? I did this because 6 
times 6 is 36, and 6 plus 6 is 12, and because I want to keep this in standard form, I add, I made 36 1.6 and added a 1 to the 12 to make it 13, and the bottom is 7 times 10 to the minus 11. Now I want to try and simplify further, so that's going to be 3.6 times 10 to the 14 over 7 times 10 to the minus 11. And what am I going to do here? What I'm going to do here is now try and solve the question. So, 3 point, uh, 3 point six times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 7 times 10 to the minus 11. I'm first going to deal with the times 10 powers. So I'm going to do 3.6 over 7 times by 10 to the 25. And now I want to work out what 3.6 over 7 is. That is equal to about 0 0.51 times 10 to the 25. So that's our answer to the question. Everything's in standard form and to one significant figure. So this will go to... Ooh, let's have a look here. This is not in standard form, because it starts with zero point. So let's quickly make that into the correct form. So 5.1 times 10 to the 24. And if that's to one significant figure, that's 5 times 10 to the 24. And therefore, the answer to this question is A. And that's question number 16 completed. Question number 17. The diagram shows the external view of the human heart. Which of the following statements about the artery shown on the diagram is slash R correct? It is the site of diffusion of glucose and oxygen into the muscle cells of the heart. That's statement number one. Statement number two. It transport blood at high blood at high pressure. Three, it contains muscle cells. So which statements are correct? This is a very easy question if you know the content and you can do some eliminations to help you. So let's start with statement number one. It is the site of diffusion of glucose and oxygen into the muscle cells of the heart. This is incorrect. The oxygenated blood that is full of glucose in the arteries goes into the capillaries and that's where gas exchange occurs gas exchange occurs and where uh, glucose uptake occurs for the muscles so therefore anything with number one is incorrect so b is incorrect e is incorrect f is incorrect h is incorrect statement number two is transported at high pressure this is true. Blood is pumped around at high uh, pressure around the body. Not too high, but high pressure so that the blood flows constantly and there's never any pooling of blood. Statement number two is correct. So let's find an answer that has two in it. And now statement number three. It contains muscle cells. And that is correct. Arteries do have muscle cells lining them. So therefore, C is wrong, and the answer is G. That's question number 17 completed. Question number 18. Propanoic acid is a monoproctic acid. Magnesium is a group 2 metal. Which of the following chemical equations is correct for the reaction between magnesium carbonate and propanoic acid? So, straight away you should be thinking about acid-base reactions. When a metal carbonate reacts with an acid, you get a product of a metal salt, water, and carbon dioxide. 
So immediately you can eliminate A. Now, since propanoic acid is monoproctic and magnesium is a group two metal, one magnesium molecule will react with two propanoic acid molecules in a neutralization reaction. So, with this information, we could answer the rest of the question and do some further eliminations. So, there should be one magnesium carbonate and two propanoic acids. So, for B, that's incorrect. That's a one-to-one -one ratio in the reactants. C, there is a two-to-one ratio, so that's correct. D, that is incorrect because that's the wrong acid altogether, though it's in the right in the right ratio of two to one. And E, that's in the wrong ratio one to three instead of two to one. And therefore your answer is C. That is question number 18 completed. Question number 19. A swimming pool is 10 meters wide. A loud sound is made in the water two meters from one wall and the reflected sounds are detected with a microphone placed next to the sound source. The reflection from the wall is eight meters away. Uh, from the wall eight meters away arrives 0.01 seconds after the reflection from the wall 0.2 meters away. What is the speed of sound in water? So step number one for me is to draw a diagram. Step number two will be to work out the two distances between each wall and the speaker slash detector. Step number three is to work out the difference in distance. Step number four is to input this difference of distance into speed equals distance over time. And therefore I'll get the answer to the question. So step number one, draw a diagram. Here's my pool, here's my speaker, slash detector. This is eight meters. This is two meters. Two lots of eight is equal to 16. And two lots of two is equal to four. And now I can move on to step three, which is to work out the difference in distance. 16 minus four is equal to 12. And now I know the difference, the distance difference. Now, I can move on to step number four. I could input this value of 12 into speed is equal to distance over time to work out the speed. So 12 over 0 0.01 is equal to 12,000 meters per second. That means the answer is E, and that is question number 19 completed. Question number 20. Express 1 over 2x plus 1 over x minus 1 minus 1 over x as a single algebraic fraction. So, step number one would be to work out the lowest common denominator for each of these fractions and make sure each fraction has that as their lowest common denominator. Step number two will be to merge everything together as one fraction, because since the denominator is the same, we could add everything in the numerator together. And step number three will be to simplify. So, let's get cracking. So, what is the lowest common denominator for this? it will be 2x bracket x minus 1. Okie dokie. So now I'm going to do is do that is this is equal to x minus 1 over 2x x minus 1 plus 2x over 2x, x minus 1, plus 2x minus 1, 
over 2x, x minus 1. So, step number 1 is done. Step number 2, as you remember, is to make sure everything is now one fraction. So, we know what the denominator of this fraction is going to be. 2x, x minus 1. And now, all of these numerators can now go into this one common numerator. And that's going to be x minus 1 plus 2x plus 2x minus 2. Now, step number three, we're going to have to simplify this bad boy. And hmm, uh, this is why you need to be careful. I made a mistake over here. That should be a minus, not a plus. Even I make these silly mistakes, but you need to make sure that you're on top of what's written where. So over here, I could have made a silly mistake. Thankfully, I spotted it. That'll be minus. I'll go to plus. That is correct. Now, as I was saying, let's go to simplifying. So that goes to, let's get all the x's together. Goes to x plus 1 over 2x, x minus 1. That cannot be simplified down any further. That means the answer to this question is E. That is question number 20 completed. Question number 21. The family tree shows the inheritance of freckles. And the family tree is below alongside with the key. Which row in the table shows the probability that the next child produced by parents 1 and 2 and the probability that the next child produced by parents 5 and 6 will have freckles? So, immediately you should be able to tell that freckles are a dominant trait. This is because it doesn't seem to skip generations. So now let's focus on the offspring of parent one and parent number two. And in order to do this, we first need to work out the genotype of parent one and parent two. Parent two obviously has a genotype of little f, little f. This is because they don't have freckles. And parent one has a genotype of big F, little f. This is because child number four doesn't have freckles and therefore parent one has to be heterozygous. Using this information, we could create a Punnett square to work out the probability that the next child will or will not have freckles. So let's do exactly that. So parent number one is big F, little f, and parent number two is little f, little f. Therefore, this will be their offspring genotype. And from this, you could determine that 50% will be little f, little f, and 50% will be big f, little f. And therefore, you could, deter you could assume that the probability that their next child will have freckles will be 0.5 or 50%. So let's keep that in mind. Now, let's focus on the offspring of parents 5 and 6. Both parents 5 and 6 have freckles, and their genotype will be big F, little f. This is because they both have freckles, 
but they were unable to have children without, uh, but were able to have children without speckle, uh, freckles. I was about to say speckles there. Quite a laugh. So let's join, let's draw that Punnett square. So we have big F, little f, big F, little f, and then the offspring will be big F, big F, big F, little f, big F, little f, little f, little f. Therefore, the probability that their child, next child will have freckles will be 0.75 or 75%. This is because out of the four squares, you have big F. You have three of them that can express freckles, and they are big F, big F, little f, little f, a uh, big F, little f, and big F, little f. So, armed with this information, that the probability that uh, that the next child produced by parents one and two will have freckles is zero point five, we could do some eliminations. We can eliminate A, we can eliminate C, we can eliminate E, we can eliminate G. And the probability that the next child produced by parents 5 and 6 will have freckles is 0 0.75. So we can eliminate B, F, H. And the answer is D. And that is question 21 completed. Question number 22. Hydrated copper 2 sulfate has the formula CuSO4 5H2O. 100 centimeters cubed of a solution contained 5 grams of hydrated copper 2 sulfate. What's the concentration in moles per decimeter cubed of this solution? So, there are two things, two equations that you need to do. You need to work out the moles. And then from the moles, you need to work out the concentration. So step number one is to work out the moles of the hydrated copper 2 sulfate. And moles is equal to mass over MR. And what is the MR? The MR is the molecular weight of the hydrated copper to sulfate and they've kindly gave, given you the molecular weight of hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur and copper. So the MR is equal to 64 plus 30 2 plus 4, open bracket 16, close bracket, plus 5, 18. The total of that is 250. What a nice round even number. So let's input the MR into our moles equation. Moles equal to 10 over 250 which is equal to 1 over 25. Now that we know the moles we can work out the concentration. Concentration is equal to the moles divided by the volume. The units is for moles is moles and the volume is decimeters cubed. Right now our volume is in centimeters cubed and 100 centimeters cubed is equal to 0 0.1 decimeters cubed. So now let's work out the concentration. 1 divided by 25 is equal, uh, 1 over 25 divided by 0 0.1, because that's our volume in decimeters cubed, is equal to 0 0.4 moles per decimeter cubed. And therefore, the correct answer is B. And that is question number 22 completed.
Question number 23. A book rests on a table, which in turn rests on the floor. The floor exerts a force P on the table. Force P and another force constitute a Newton's third law interaction pair of forces. What is the other force? So immediately you should be thinking equal and opposite forces. Newton's third law of interaction pairs exerts equal and opposite force on one another. This means that in addition to the floor exerting a force on the table, the table must exert a fo force on the floor. Therefore, the answer to this question is F. This is an adduction question. You just need to know Newton's three laws. Question number 24. The diagram shows the shape made from a quarter circle of radius 6 cm and a right angled triangle with a hypotenuse of length 9 cm. Which of the following expression gives the area in centimetres squared or in square centimetres of the shape? So how you'd approach this question is by first working out the area of the quarter circle and then work out the area of the triangle. As you could see, the triangle's area isn't so easy to calculate and I'll go into that further. So let's start off with calculating the area of the quarter circle. So... To calculate an area of a circle, it's pi times r squared. We want to work out a quarter of that, so it'll be a quarter pi r squared. And we know the radius is 6 of this semicircle, so therefore we could do a quarter times by 6 squared times by pi. And what does that equal to? That equals to 36 times by a quarter times by pi, which is equal to 9 pi. So that is equal to 9 pi. So we've done step number one. Step number two is working out the area of this triangle. And the formula for working out the area of a triangle is half base times height. We have the height over here of 6 centimetres, but we don't have the base. However, we do have the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle. So therefore, using Pythagoras' theorem, which is a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, we could work out the base of this triangle, therefore work out the area of this triangle. So let's use Pythagoras' theorem to work out the base first. So 6 squared plus x squared is equal to 9 squared. 36 plus x squared is equal to 81. x squared is equal to 81 minus 36, which is equal to 45. What is x? x is the square root of 45, which is equal to 3 over 5. So we now know what the base is, 3 root 5. We know what the height is, 6 centimetres. So let's work out the area. So a half times 6 times 3 root 5 is equal to, you guessed it, 9 root 5. And let's add the two areas together. So the area of the triangle is 9 root 5 plus the area of the quarter circle is 9 pi. And that's your answer. And therefore, the answer to this question is C. And that is question number 24 completed. Question number 25. The picture shows a Siamese cat. This type of cat has a gene which is sensitive to temperature. When this gene is inactive in the cells, the coat colour is pale. 
when the gene is active, it produces an enzyme which causes the coat colour to be darker. If this cat had grown up in a warmer environment to its ears, front of face, paws and tail would be paler than those shown in the picture below. A student wrote the following statements using this information. Statement number one, the enzyme is denatured at internal body temperature of the cat, so the coat color is pale. Statement number two, the temperature of the ears, front of face, paws, and tail is cooler than body temperature, so they are darker. Statement number three, coat color in Siamese cats depends on both genes and environment. Which of these statements is slash are correct? So this is a lovely elimination style question that can be done very quickly. Statement number one is incorrect. This is because if the coat color is pale, the gene is inactive and the enzyme is not produced. The enzyme is not denatured. There is a difference between denatured and inactive. So statement one is incorrect. So we could eliminate anything with statement one. So that's B, E, F, H. Now let's look at statement number two. Statement number two is correct. This is because the coat color is darker at cooler temperatures. And since the ears and pores are dark, we can conclude that they are cooler than the body's temperature. So let's give that a big fat tick. And anything with two is correct and anything that excludes two is incorrect. So we can eliminate A, we can eliminate D. Now statement number three. Statement number three is correct. Genes code for the enzyme that regulates coat color, but the activation of this gene is dependent on the environment. Let's give a fat tick to number three as well. C is incorrect, and therefore G is the answer to this question. And that is question number 25 completed. Question number 26. What is the volume of hydrogen gas formed when measured at room temperature and pressure when 0.3 grams of pure sodium reacts completely with excess of water? The AR values are below. Assume that the molar volume of gas at room temperature is 24 decimeters cubed. So, step number one, write an equation. So, we have Na, we have H2O, that goes to our salt, well, not our salt, our hydroxide, and AOH, and hydrogen gas. And now let's balance our equation. There we go. I assume I don't have to go through balancing with you, but just a quick gloss over. There needs to be equal numbers of each atom, of each element on each side of the equation, on the left side and the right side. That's how you balance an equation. So now that we've done that, we now know that for every one mole of sodium that reacts with water, 0.1 of a hydrogen gas is formed. So in other words, two moles of sodium is required to produce one mole of hydrogen gas. And now this is a simple calculate moles of the sodium, use of ratios, that's the moles of the hydrogen gas. And then from there, you could work out what the volume of gas, hydrogen gas is. So... 0 0.23 over 23 will give us the moles of the sodium. So that is 0 0.01. And we know that for every two moles of sodium, there is one mole of hydrogen gas. So we divide 0 0.01 by 2, and that gives us 0 0.005. And we multiply that by our... 24 moles, uh, 24 decimeter cubed because we have 0 0.005 
moles of hydrogen gas, and one mole of hydrogen gas has the equivalent volume of 24 decimeters cubed. That gives us 0 0.12. Therefore, the answer is B. That's question number 26 completed. Question number 27. A graph related to the kinetic energy is drawn with kinetic energy in joules on the y-axis and the square of the speed in meters squared, seconds squared on the x-axis. A graph of this type is plotted for an object of mass 2.5 kg traveling along the surface of the Earth. The resulting graph is a straight line. What is the numerical value of the gradient of this line? So, when you see the word kinetic energy, you should be thinking of E is equal to a half mv squared. And they gave you the variables as well. They gave you E, they gave you v squared, they gave you the mass. So, that's the equation that you should be thinking of straight away. And they referred to this graph being a straight line. And the straight line graph equation is y equals mx plus c. So, we basically want to make this equation in this format. Immediately, you can see there's no c, there's no y-intercept over here. So, we don't need that. And now we need to work out the mx part of the e equals half mv squared. We know that the velocity squared changes, so therefore that's your x variable. So we could remove that. And now we're left with the gradient, where the gradient of the line is equal to a half times by the mass. Now, we were told earlier on that the object weighs 2.5 kg. So let's do a half times 2.5 kg. That's equal to 1.25 kg. And therefore, the answer to this question is C. That's question number 27 completed. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want more content like this. Also leave a comment if you want further clarification on any questions. Or if you have a suggestion for another video that I should make. Thank you very much and hopefully see you next time on my next video.